Hi, welcome to Brewing Beer the Hard Way. Today I have a very special episode. I'm here in Armstrong, BC at the Gamerness Malting Company. Um, in 1993, we uh, purchased a decommissioned facility in Germany. It was uh, basically taken apart there, put into containers and shipped over to Canada where it was uh, rebuilt here. So this facility has been here for, uh, I guess, about 23 years now. And um, it's an older system, but it, it works well. And then our new facility is our big expansion we did about two years ago. It is essentially the same type of process. It's more linear, um, and it uses a forced air kiln versus a boiler system. But, um, but the technologies in here are much more modern than what we have in the old facility, okay. which allows us to have a greater control over the product that we create. We bring all of our grain in uh, in the same way, which is on uh, Super B trucks. We don't have any around at the moment. And uh, it comes in the 42 ton trucks that basically drop in from their belly into our system here where it is uh, reclaimed and then taken into this into our system uh, to be cleaned and then processed into malt. Um, all of our varieties have different bins so that uh, certain products are specific to, to varieties to make for better products and so um, all of our different uh, varieties are, are isolated and used for those specific batches. So with things like oh, low protein, high protein, low high moisture, yeah. plumpness, all those kinds of things are separated because uh, each one of our, our malts has a specific need, of course. So before we get the grain, we go into we get a sample from the farmer. We analyze that sample, and that uh, will tell us if it fits within our criteria. If it does, then we accept it, and we go into contract with that farmer. And then when the grain comes in, we take another sample, and we analyze it again to make sure it matches what we had uh, went into contract with them about. And then uh, if it does match it, we continue to process it, process it into malt. If it doesn't, then we actually reject it right on the spot for feed. Yeah, because, um, you know, we, because we are a small malting house, um, not to sound cliche, but for us it's service and quality. And uh, that's what keeps us as a, a, you know, a successful company is making sure that we adhere to specific quality standards. And that uh, kind of keeps us separated from the, kind of the bigger guys out there. So for us, uh, the quality starts on, on the raw product, of course. And uh, because we're a small place, we can be very selective where we get our grain throughout BC and Alberta. And that allows us to have, uh, right from the get-go, a better quality grain than you get from the guys who have to source you know, a million metric tons because then they have to just take what they get. We source right now about 15,000 metric tons of raw, which gives us about 11,000 metric tons of, of finished product. So you do about you have about a 20% loss, which is a fairly industry standard. Right. Um, that usually comes with. I mean, when you get the product, it's about 10 to 12% moisture. When it's finished, it's sitting around four to five. Okay. Right. So you just have loss and weight just from the moisture content itself, plus all the cleaning and, and all the other quality control things we have in place that take a, a lot of the uh, the stuff you don't want in there, like the, the smaller kernels and those kinds of things. And so we end up with about 80 to 81% left over at the end, okay? And uh, um, most all of it uh, is cleaned before it gets here and then re-cleaned again, okay? So let's go inside and I'll show you the next steps. Is there a big demand for the local BC? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, we have... Uh, the taxation laws, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar, but they have changed in BC and allows um, a tax credit or a tax incentive for distilleries at the moment to, for those distilleries that are using all BC made product, um, that they get a, uh, a basically a, a tax credit or a tax incentive to, oh, really? to use it. Yeah. And from what I understand, I don't know the exact numbers, but how I understand it's actually quite, makes a huge impact. Um, especially on the profit side of things. And so there's been a bit, uh, sort of a mini boom of distilleries in BC at the moment. And from what we understand, uh, it sounds like they may extend that to breweries. And so um, that's not more of the rumor at, at the moment. But we have lots of breweries calling us already to ask about uh, access to BC malt and those kinds of things. Right. Currently, all we do is a, a pale malt in BC, which is exactly the same as a, any other conventional pale, um, just using all BC farmers. Last year, uh, BC actually was kind of outside of the uh, weather issues that we were having last year, like the drought issues. And so when we had the late season rain and those things that caused all the problems in southern Alberta, BC stayed largely uh, protected from that. And so this year we get, I would say, about uh, close to a third of our total grain from British Columbia in general. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, so it's been uh, it's been very positive in that manner for right. us. And since we're the only industrial malting house in British Columbia, it's really a, it's a huge advantage for us to have that. So we're... We're right now just focusing on the pale, BC pale malt, but um, as we grow and as the demand increases, we will consider doing some of the other specialty stuff in BC stuff as well. The problem with the BC grain is it's a little higher in protein, 
And so um, typically it doesn't make for a good like Pilsner, for example. We own this and we have the blueprints and the okay for the city to already uh, expand everything you see here in another expansion. Oh, wow. So um, there's no set date for that, but that really depends on the, the market and our customers. We expanded because our customers were expanding um, and uh, we're just, we're just going to follow those trends and if it, if it means another expansion, then we'll consider that as well. Okay. We have very, very little industrial waste in general. We go to great lengths to try to reduce our, our carbon footprint. Just the, just the art of making malt itself requires lots of natural resources, gas, electrical, and water. And so we, uh, we do the best we can to minimize it in other areas. Um, so after the grain comes through here, it gets cleaned out. It goes up to the dry steeps, which are silos that sit above the steep tanks at the top, which will go next. And, uh, and that's kind of the first step in the molding process. So these are our steep tanks. This is the first step in the molding process after the grain's been cleaned. Uh, we have two steep tanks and each vat is the bolt. The tank holds 15,000 liters of water and 15 metric tons of grain. So each batch for us is about 30 tons. Okay. Basically, what we do here is kind of where our recipes start to differ from what the industry does. So some of the stuff that happens in here in the next phases, I can't really elaborate too much on. But, um, but basically, the steeping process helps a couple things. It helps them to uh, get the moisture into the kernels. It helps to clean the material off, like any of the contaminants off the grain. Which floats to the top, the beer off. It is uh, collected. Actually, the bearing is all collected and put right in the bottom, and that's given away to farmers as part of the waste. And then uh, uh, we basically have aerators at the bottom that churn it up. And that helps, again, to uh, accelerate the growing process. And the water will fill up about, uh, you can almost see the water line. Oh, yeah. Okay. talked about over there, this is basically um, 30 tons of grain sitting on a perforated stainless steel screen. The auger system goes back and forth and 
churns up the grain so that the grain doesn't grow clumped together and so that all the grain in there gets treated uh, uniformly. Um, basically how we get the grain in the bin is it comes from the steep tanks through these steep lines and it's just gravity fed. Each one of those valves is open and closed to allow the grain to flow into the, to the bin. Um, and then uh, basically these augers flat, flatten out the grain and, and make it an even depth batch in there. And the even depth is, is important because underneath the screens there's a, basically a giant air plenum. There's a 35,000 CFM fan at the tail end here and that blows controlled air uh, targeting 18 to 22 degrees Celsius uh, air to come through and the water sits around 18 degrees Celsius coming from above. So when the temperature is controlled at that warmth and at that target it allows for a little rapid growth of the grain in general and uh, in, a, in a short amount of time within just a couple days um, it starts to sprout already. If it's left to just grow on its own, we can actually get temperatures of upwards of 50 degrees Celsius in the center of the product. Um, just because it's so deep. It's so deep, yeah, exactly. And depending on what we're trying to make, if it's a honey, for example, it would be turned less. If it's a pail, it would be turned more because we want it, We have the, a different requirement on the tail end of the taste of the honey than we do a pail. And so you get some of that from the, we call it, it's called it stewing. Or, um, what I can do is show you what some of the uh, grain looks like. One of the interesting ways to tell if something has been germinated enough, and this is what the malt masters will do, is they'll take the kernel and squeeze it in between their fingers like this, and you want the consistency of like chalk that you would use on a chalkboard. So this is almost perfectly actually germinated at this point. It's a little bit under modified, so the extra day will really help. So at this point here, what we would do is we would start uh, to decrease the water um, and decrease the temperature so that by this time tomorrow, we can move it from here to the kiln. That's where a lot of the uh, sort of the art from the malt master comes in. They come in, they smell it, squeeze it, they taste it, they get moisture checks, they check the aquaspurs, they check all the different things. And uh, if it's not modified enough, well then we give it more time. If it's already overly modified, then we quickly get it out of here, rapidly cool it off, and get it in the kiln. But this is why it requires the day-to-day -day attention. Um, and as a, as a craft malster, um, this is where we're lucky and that is our batches are small enough that we can do that day-to-day -day correction and, uh, and change the, you know, the recipe or the result based off of, uh, on hourly, really. A typical malting house has about a 300 ton batch, we're at a 30 ton batch. So we're 10% the size of a typical malting house in terms of processing anyways. And uh, in a big malting house, it would be nearly impossible, if not possible, to make sure that corner over there and the far corner over there are exactly the same. But this bed, right at basically the precipice of being an industrial versus hand, hand, handmade. So we're right there where industrial and handmade meet. And so it gives us the flexibility of doing things by hand, but leveraging technology is to make it on the industrial scale. So any bigger than this, the by hand would be probably useless. Any smaller, well, we wouldn't really get any usefulness out of, the, out of the big machines that help us. So that's about, we will always, no matter how big of a company we become, we will always have that same size bed. It's pivotal to uh, our success in creating those specialized bolts, basically. Okay. And in the new facility, we use this forced air system. And uh, as, as far as we understand it, we're the only application of its type in North America. And it's a 7.2 million BTU furnace that basically cooks our or gets our kiln heated up to about uh, about 110 degrees uh, centigrade, which um, allows us to achieve a few things, and that is uh, some of our specialty malts. Uh, in under 24 hours, okay? So, whereas before it would take 30, 30 plus, yeah. okay? So it's a huge advantage for just production, and uh, and it's actually much easier to, to maintain uh, this kind of system versus a boiler system, because you need all the, all the other certificates and stuff that come along with having a power engineer and all those kinds of things. Here, it's just like a furnace at home, just, you know, seven million times the size. <laughs> but basically, this system gives us a lot more flexibility over the old system. We have about 15 different sensors, from pressure sensors to uh, you know, humidity, uh, temperature obviously, and a bunch of other different kind of sensors in there that allow us so to control many different variables at any given point. It certainly has uh, become a very powerful tool in our ability to create really quality, good products. So, but it was a certain, uh, definitely a learning curve, you know, especially being there's no knowledge out there on you know if you have problems, we're largely left to figure it out on our own. 
because it's not like we can just call up some guy down the street in another melting house who has a system like it and tell us what they did. Unfortunately, um, that doesn't exist. So right. anyone in the future will be able to call us, but as it stands, we're on our own. And uh, but we have a lot of competent guys who work for us, and a lot of you know 23 years of history of knowledge, information that we're able to basically work on and use, and uh, allowed us to well get it to where it is today, which is it's working out really well for us. So a lot of external help obviously, and contractors to get it going. Um, now that we've worked out all the, all the commissioning kinks and those kinds of things, uh, the recipes and the details and how to use it is now for us. And so we'll, we'll work in tandem with these guys whenever we have issues or, or questions or we want some sort of uh, change, like a big, I, you know, there's a ton of things that we had to change over the past couple of years on it to get it to work. And so we would work with those guys to implement those changes. Um, but now we're at a point where it's stable and we, uh, we just basically, uh, you know, we'll run a batch and study the information and analyze the data and then uh, make adjustments here and there uh, wherever we need to. So we'll have one guy out there in the bed yeah. watching the grain come in and one guy in here uh, spreading out the grain. Okay. It's about 20 feet to the, to the bed below or to the floor below us, sorry. It's another perforated stainless steel screen below us, below there. And then it goes 20 feet to the basement floor and the furnace up top that feeds the, the hot air comes through the basement, goes through a distributor, almost like a diffuser like you see in a light and then the air spreads out evenly as it comes in underneath and the idea is it cooks up through evenly. Um, and it goes like start to finish, all the kilning is done in, in on here. this bed. Yes, yeah. exactly, absolutely, yeah. We have a single room kiln, all of the product comes through here and the recipes vary of course from product to product. Yeah. Um, the idea is color comes from moisture and heat. So a pail would be uh, less moisture is coming in and less heat cooking. Whereas like an M30 or an M60 or something darker, like a, like a 30 love or a 60 love, would be a lot hotter and a lot more moisture. So those two things combined will give you color, essentially. Right. Okay. Um, when we're done here, basically the bed lifts up. You can see the marks on the walls back there. The whole bed tilts about 45 degrees and the grain slides off into a reclaim that's sitting below our feet. It's after the kiln has been emptied already. Um, the floor has been tilted and the grain has fallen and it uh, leaves behind, of course, the, uh, the bare floor, which just like the germination beds is a perforated stainless steel. Um, perforations are a little bit different to allow for more airflow um, than they are in the germination bed. Um, no water is added here, it's simply just air. So the, the goal in here, of course, is to get the moisture out of the grain. So the last step in the process is what we call series of porcelain paddles in this little system here. The grain is taken from the kiln up through this bucket elevator, dropped through this magnet array, which I'll talk about in a second, and then passes through this decoder. What the derooter does is essentially as the grain passes through, it has the aquifers and tailings still on there, screenings on there. It gets knocked off, just lightly, cleaned up, and then all of the stuff that's knocked off is, caught, is basically captured, and put in a silo, and we sell it uh, to farmers for feed. It's a really good quality stuff. It's around 25% protein. Right. Um, so it's kind of sought after. As it passes down through the palmer, which is, you can tell, a very messy job to clean this off every day, but there's just so much grain passing through it's all so Passes through the aerator, there's Loa, that just puts a, a light pair passes through the grain as it falls down, and pulls all the dust and, the, and all the old columns and stuff off there, yeah, yeah. leaving a final clean product with the bag system. Like I said, it gets reclaimed. If you look in here, you can see why it's so messy. As the grain comes through, through these rare earth magnets. Those rare earth magnets is about ten thousand dollars worth of magnets sitting there. All right. And the reason for this is systems like like we have here are largely mechanical, and they run off metal components like bolts and nuts and those kinds of things. And they just naturally wear and tear as you uh, as the system runs. And so what happens? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Obviously, you don't want that kind of stuff inside the product. And so anywhere on the facility where we're moving grain passes through magnets and streams. And that catches uh, 
So anything like this, for example, that I would have broken off somewhere in the system, will be captured on the magnet, so it doesn't end up in the brewery. Because if it gets in their mill, those mills are really soft and sensitive equipment, and they do a lot of damage. Right. So we go to great extent to, to reduce the likelihood of something like that getting into the product. Um, so like I said, anywhere we move the grain, we'll pass through these kinds of systems. As the grain comes out of the derooter, it comes through here, and this is the same stuff we were just looking at two seconds ago. Um, it falls through that screen. There's another series of uh, another array of magnets underneath that, and uh, it goes up the bucket elevator and then distributed into one of these silos. These silos are specific to the product, the final product. So you can even take some grain out of here and try it if you like. Sure. I can tell what it is. <laughs> That's ESP. Yeah, I eat about a half a kilogram a week, so. Every time we do it, we, all of our finished product is analyzed again, and uh, I like to taste it, to make sure that, well, it's part of the quality control, right? Basically, anywhere in the world. It allows us to see what's happening in there. If there's issues, we can log in to see. We're collecting all this information, and uh, this is where um, some of my skill set has come in, where I've been able to, we put a whole like fiber optic service system throughout the facility. All the communication kind of goes to a central hub in the office, and we can analyze this data on the fly, um, we wrote some programs to help us plot the information that we get off the kiln so that it can tell us kind of, well, point out any obvious things that can be corrected. So um, if there's pressure issues or heat issues, you know, we can see it visually and we can make the adjustments on the recipes to handle that. If I give you an example, with this new forced air system, the heat rise, the rise, the rate, sorry, the, uh, the rate of rise is a lot faster than with the boiler system. So we can get a lot hotter a lot quicker. Well, that has... That show, basically what we learn is in the summer and the winter that has a big impact. In the summer when it's a lot hotter outside, we get a lot, hot, lot hotter a lot quicker. So we had to trim down some of the heat um, so that we could have that slower cooking, if you will, that we're looking for. In the winter it's the opposite effect. So with the cold air outside, it takes us a little bit longer so we can turn up the heat. So just analyzing that information as we move forward helped us really to uh, adjust on the fly, seasonal and weather changes that have happened so that we can uh, continue to maintain that quality we're looking for or that specific recipe regardless of what's happening environmentally. Yep. We have 40 bags per pallet at 25 kilograms per bag, so that's a, that's a one ton pallet. Okay? Before we had a palletizing system like this, it was all done by hand and the guys maxed out at about 19 pallets a day. Our current record is 47 pallets a day. Excuse me. And that 47 pallets is uh, largely done with just two or three guys. And so wow. it really removes a lot of the potential injury from the guys from having to lift that much weight all the time, as well as it consistently and uniformly packages every pallet. So if you look over there and you see the product is standing there, the customer knows what they're getting, they know how much room to have in their warehouse, they know how much room to allocate for our stuff coming in because it's always gonna be the same. Uh, the trucking companies, they know exactly uh, what kind of truck they need to use to haul uh, the specific weights to our customers and those kinds of things. So it's really helped us out. Um, really helped us to reduce also issues like pallets falling over or those kinds of things that can be caused by human error. And so for the investment we made in this, it was a huge impact on, our, on the final shipping quality, which is also a very important part of the, of the line, right? You want the customers getting the product and you want it to look good when they get it, not just, you know, slumped over with holes in the bags and those kinds of things. So this has really helped us achieve an almost zero um, issue rate in the, in the warehouse now. We sell to a lot of like brewer supplies, so like BSG, you know, Larry's, Cargill, Inland Empire, home brews like Pop Dogs, um, Dan's in Vancouver. Great customers, but we don't know exactly how many of their customers there are as well. Um, we can we know that the home brewing industry is growing because the people that are buying our our product to supply to the home brewers, they're they're requesting more product, and so we can tell that there is definitely some growth there, but. Um, it's, I, to give a specific number would be really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, one of the things is for sure though, and I've learned in the small time I've been in the industry, is that the home brewers, um, they, they're a very, very important piece of the success of this company and moving forward in general, because those are the guys that end up coming, becoming the next brewers. You know, it's the guys that were sitting in the, uh, you know, in their garages for a couple of years, tinkering away, and then found a love or a passion for it, and then uh, suddenly they decide they want to uh, you know, start their own brewery. And I've seen a lot of stories like that, and it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, there's lots of people that are brewers that were something else, you know, whether it's an IT yeah. guy or, you know, a psychologist or whatever, and uh, they just got a passion for it. 
So I'm a huge supporter of the, of the homebrew um, industry. I think they're pivotal to the success of, of the craft brew industry in general, and uh, they're, the, they're future brewers. Period. And uh, so I like to uh, I like to put as much effort as I can into working with them. And, and uh, we have one of the things that we allow here, or that we try to promote, is that the homebrewers can call us and ask questions. You know. And uh, Matthias uh, Haben, Haben, sorry, is our, our malt master, and uh, he's he's on the phone all the time, just helping people with uh, with their struggles on their end on how to use the product, oh, really? and those kinds of things. So yeah. we try to keep an open form in that regard because we know the importance yeah. of the home issues. Nice. We ship out of three different types of options. We have our 25 or 50 uh, pound bags, 25 kilogram, 50 pound bags. We have our totes, which anywhere from 250 to 750 kgs. And, uh, and then bulk trucks that go out, and those trucks are up typically around the 21 metric. Okay. So we have um, some of the examples of our product that we have right now in the warehouse are Dark Munich, which is about a 30 to 35 love. We have Pilsner, which is in the 1.5 love range. Vienna in the 4.5, 5.5 range. Um, our wheat, which is uh, basically supposed to mimic a pale, so it would be in the same kind of range as a pale on a 2 love. Um, we have some organic pale back there. We have some organic Pilsner back there, some ESB, which is in our typical three and a half love range. Um, our Munich 10, which is our 10 to 15 love. Our, our Pale, which is also our BC Pale, so th those would be the same. And then the very back there, which is one of our most popular uh, blends or brands, I should say, is our Honey Malt, and that sits around the 20 to 25 love. That is the most difficult product to make out of all of our products. It takes a lot of attention, a lot of analysis, it probably takes 30% of our production management time just to make wow. one batch per week. Okay. Yeah. As part of our attempt to have as much or as little industrial waste as possible, what we've done is we've taken uh, our spent water, we collect it all in this little pond basically, we treat it and then we give it away to the farmers in the valley below. Um, one of the farmers has a big reservoir basically like a pond and we fill that pond up during the winter and uh, during the summer he uses it to irrigate his farms down there. Um, so all of our water is reused either uh, for keeping our own irrigation on the lawns and stuff here alive or uh, to give to the farmers down in the valley. In the winter time it's really funny because because the water will be nice and warm it doesn't freeze because of the temperature of the water going in um, and all the nutrients in the water will get 600 plus ducks in here and they're huge ducks because they sit here all day and eat grain and, and bathe in the water so it's pretty funny even a few today but this pond just allows us to be that just a little bit more environmental friendly instead of just dumping it down the drain we, uh, we use a lot so we try to make sure that the farmers can get access to it